sense here to drive this pawn into d5 in order to prevent this knight from developing. This gives white a big space advantage. I actually played like this with black once or twice. It's not that bad, but it's certainly not a particularly good position. Okay, now let's develop our pieces. Knight c3. We could also play c4, uh, expanding our central control, but that would be more... You know, we're playing 1e4, so this preserves the spirit. Knight e7, okay, super passive play by black. And mm, he's still not doing anything horrible, but it's about time we considered reopening the center. But let's not do that just yet. Let's see how he proceeds. Let's develop our other knight, and then let's see how he plays. Because if he plays knight d7, then we'll take on e6. We want to optimize that moment when we take on, on e6. Okay, he plays h6. So he's really asking for it, but... Okay, so we have a way of playing here rather than taking immediately. And this concept of trying to find the best way to execute ideas is always so important, right? D takes C6 opens up the center. But there's a particular move that we can start with which really makes D takes C6 a lot stronger because D6 he can play Bishop takes C6. What am I talking about here? It's also a development move. So this move should come to a lot of you guys just as a development, right? Bishop B5 check. But it also forces him to cover cover that check on d7. And then by taking on e6, we do not allow black's bishop. Black's bishop is now pinned. It's weird to talk about a bishop pinning a bishop, but this is a pin. In addition, that bishop blocks the queen's contact with d6, which means that after we play d6, black is basically busted. If he plays f takes e6, he, he loses the d-pawn. If he takes on b5, how should we proceed? And there's actually more than one possibility here. But the sort of thematic move, knight takes b5, there's queen a5. So we always look for intermediate moves in these positions. We drive his king out. And one thing I want you guys to see, Ansel, is after knight takes b5, will queen a5 check win a piece? Does queen, Have we blundered here? Yeah, no, because we can simply go back to c3. And that's something people sometimes miss. You can block a check... You can block a fork by doing two things with the fork piece, blocking the check with that very piece. So the he might play queen a5, he plays queen b6, which is a whole lot worse because now he gives up another pawn. Right. And because he's positioned this, that's the, the danger of blocking the development of a piece, right? He's positioned the knight very poorly. Now he's down two pawns and his position is in shambles. King at, and he makes it worse by bringing his king out to f6. So I'm sure that there's probably many mates here. There's many ways to find mate. And this process of finding mate is, is not the easiest to describe logically. It's, all, it's in many cases a, pa a question of pattern recognition. Um, but the first move I think we can play pretty much automatically. What check do we have? I think some of you guys are seeing 98 check. I think I thought about, but he comes back to f7. But we can drive the king in into one particular direction. Yeah, I like the concept of e5 check. Let's see where he goes. All right, now I see a really pretty idea, which is hard to find. I, I can't fully explain why I see it. Okay, I can't explain how I see it. So first of all, we're looking for checks, right? Fact one is that we're looking for checks. Um... And if you look around, there might not seem to be any appealing checks, but that's where people falter. I'm not asking for appealing checks or checks that your brain might like. Let's list them. Now, there's knight g5 check. That's the one that comes to mind. Let's consider that for a second, knight g5 check. Well, he's got to take the knight. Do we gain anything from that? Look around. Do any of your pieces have an avenue to the attack? And you could also think of you could also reverse engineer this. You could want the queen to be involved as quickly as possible. G4 is a very natural square, right? So you could come at it from the opposite end. That, I think that's how I did it subconsciously. Is I imagined the target of getting the queen to G4, and that's a devastating. Okay, so he takes on E5. That hastens the demise. Now we probably have a mate here. And we could try to find it. But if you're playing like a, a blitz game, what would be the most efficient move here? Who can tell me? What would be the most efficient move in this position? Knight c4 wins the queen. Yeah, knight c4 forks the king to the queen. So always keep your eyes peeled for these kinds of things. They can really help you when you can't find a mate and you're panicking. Um, things like knight c4 can really make sure that you're going to win the game. 
But let me think here. But you know what would be a really cool move? And somebody suggested this move. One move, and we're not trying to rub it in my opponent's face, but we need just maybe one more piece in the attack, and that'll make the mate a lot easier. How can we bring one more piece into the attack, and what piece should we bring? That king on e5, it can be checked very efficiently by a rook on e1. F4 is probably possible, but I'm thinking of castling, yeah. And what makes this move hard to find for some people is that it isn't a check, and yet it doesn't have to be, right? Um, his king is so exposed that... Who's to say we need to be in a hurry, right? Okay, so he found a nice move though, king f6. But let's still bring the rook into the attack, rook e1. Right? Okay, so he takes. Um, and now we can bring the queen into the game, queen f3 check. And uh, there's some pretty cool concepts here actually. He's gotta go king g6. Yeah, he's doing a good job escaping this. What do we do now? Yeah, we can go queen f7, but hey, we didn't bring the rook into the attack for nothing. Let's involve the rook. Now, it seems that he's escaped, but he actually hasn't. And I, I saw this line, so... Again, I probably didn't mate him in the fastest way, but I think this really is illustrating some of the key attacking concepts, and it's kind of nice. So he has a forced move. I don't know why he's thinking. Now we can... Now this queen can be repositioned to f7 by force. Uh, playing queen f7 is not the best way to do it, though. We can go queen h5. He moves his king. Then we go queen f7. And now comes the key moment, right? This is where a lot of people will be like, well, what do I do now? I don't see anything. And the first question that you have to ask yourself when you are stumped in this way is, can I bring another piece into the attack? That's oftentimes the solution to these problems where you don't quite have enough pieces. And, well, we have the knight, we have the rook, we have the queen. That bishop is pining to get involved. And we're now threatening rook h6 checkmate because this pawn is pinned by the queen. But that's not the only thing. We're also just threatening to, like, take the knight and stuff. We could have also lifted the rook back and tried to mate him on h3, but this is the most uh, clinical. Yeah, there's no way to, to stop the mate, I mean, obviously. And you might argue, well, this is very one-sided. He hasn't brought any of his pieces in. And when you've got, like, big boy attacks, okay, what's the mate here? If he stops rook h6, it's time to ask ourselves, what squares have been left behind? What squares are no longer defended? That's another good question. And you'll immediately see g6, that's checkmate. So... It definitely wasn't the best um, attacking, uh, you know, continuation, but for humans, it's very hard to find the fastest mate, even for GMs. And the reason we didn't try to take his queen is because I'm trying to play very aggressively. That was a nice game. So, yeah, so e4, c5. We didn't get a chance to play the smith Mora, which is c3. We played e6, and d6 is fine, but knight e7 is really passive. And it occurs to me that bishop e5 check was possible even immediately. But how should black play this? I mean, he should play knight f6. He should develop normally. Or even take on d5 first is, is fine. And knight takes d5, knight f6. Black is slightly worse, but it's nothing, nothing special. Right? Um, it's very important to develop actively. He develops passively. And yeah, and h6 is really asking for it. So if you're playing black here... He has a very, very clever move here. Think about what you need to do in this position. You're really underdeveloped. When you're underdeveloped, you don't want to give your opponent an opportunity to open up the center. So how should black play? Yeah, e5 is correct. e5 is correct. And that's not a desirable position, but it closes down the center. And... You know, it makes white's development advantage less significant. So in a position like this, a lot of beginners would really struggle to find plans for both sides. But obviously white is still much better. I'm not arguing that white isn't better. Uh, but white's advantage is significantly less. And yeah, the engine move is 92 here. But there's a particular reason for that. And the reason consists of 
sort of a high level plan but these positions are hard to play yeah you're rerouting the knight potentially but that's not the main reason the main reason is to pave the way for a later f4 um, and also to attack the weak pawn you'll see this plan in the benoni for example getting the knight to c4 and then supporting with a4 um, and also in the king's indian with sort of sides reversed yeah anyways um once we played he takes d6 the game was over um the game was was simply over it was just completely overwhelming one second guys i'll play one more i'm, I'm good with one more yeah so once he played h6 the rest is very straightforward he takes f7 knight takes b5 he exacerbated it with queen b6 um he exacerbated it with uh, queen b6 and now after takes this is horrible and <laughs> this is just yeah so yeah so once we played e5 the only the only uh sort of highlight here was knight g5 check and if he would have taken it we would have played queen g4 and here i would have played knight c4 i would have won the queen because we don't quite have enough pieces to play otherwise um and after king e5 this move castles was was kind of cute right queen e2 check is a mate in seven according to the computer so the fastest mate was queen e2 and queen e4 forcing him to take the knight another check with the queen then a check with the bishop and then you castle with check and this is the mate. So that's definitely not easy to find. I mean, that's that involves forcibly getting rid of the knight to get the king into the d-file. But, <laughs> so yeah. Rook e1, queen f3, rook e6. This is all very fast. Yeah, bane and four. Okay. Um, it's only slightly faster than mine. Yeah, castles is not a bad... That's castles bane and one. That's the second best move. What we did was actually second best according to the engine. So cast this is made in nine in exactly in the way that we played it too. So nice. All right, um, let's do one more. I think everybody's pretty clear on the process of attack here. Well, African bus, it's, if you know the definition of a weakness, then you'll know when your opponent is creating one. Yeah, queen f3 is a little faster. Queen f3 is made in five. Or rookie one is made in nine. So I guess the third best. Um, so for example, when he plays d6, you already know that this is a weakness because it's not defended by the e pawn and it's not defended by the c pawn. It's less about knowing when he's created a weakness and more about how to attack that weakness or whether it's significant. Let's play the next game. The world and the wife, 880. So we've been playing the Karokan as a solid opening choice for a couple of games. Now that's not the only opening that we're gonna play. Let's see how this guy handles it. A lot of people take here. Uh, beginners like to discharge the tension in the center. He plays knight c3, okay. So he's playing playing the main line. All right, so let's take. This is theory. And now there are three main moves, right? There's bishop f5, there's knight d7, and there's knight to f6. Knight to f6 is a very solid move. And it's one that highlights how to play with a slightly deficient pawn structure. So, and it's also very popular nowadays. Knight f6 used to be the least popular of the three. Now it's arguably the most popular, maybe equally as popular as bishop f5. So f3 by my opponent. He's trying to hold the knight in the center, but that's not a good move. And uh, that's not a good move because it's too early to weaken the king. All right. Now we can take the knight and play e5. I'll show that after the game. But because we're playing very solid chess, let's instead focus on development. Now, what developing move seems natural here? Yeah, bishop f5 is very good because we're, we're putting pressure on the knight and developing our bishop. And one might argue that, well, why am I not exploiting the weakness of created by f3? It's not about exploiting it immediately. It's not a race. He's going to pay the price for f3 later. Um, right now, we're going to focus on development. Bishop c4. Okay, so that's actually an interesting move because he's allowing us to take the pawn. But taking the pawn is a little bit risky from a development standpoint, and it opens up the f-file. So believe it or not, I'm actually not a huge fan of, of taking on e4. And that's a pretty high-level concept. Um, and let me write this down. 
I will expand on this after the game, but the bottom line is I'm a little bit worried that he's going to get compensation down the F file. I would do it in a real game of mine, but we're focusing on development. So instead, we're going to continue developing. Now this bishop, we're going to blunt by playing e6, but not immediately. First, let's deal with this knight, because if we play e6 and he takes on f6, he might force our queen to come out early, and I don't really like, like that. So instead, um, where should this knight go? And I'm not giving you guys a big, big, big choice, knight bd7. I know some players who are sort of allergic to putting their knights here, but in the Karokan, it's one of the drawbacks, right, of playing c6 is you take the square from them. But this arrangement of knights is really good. Knight g5 is, is a fine move. It, he's threatening checkmate. <laughs> so let's not mouse lip. But now we, of course, play e6 to blunt the bishop. It's the perfect chance to play e6. All right. So... My opponent's intentions are, are good. He's trying to open up the position and attack, but he doesn't have enough pieces in, in the action to do it. So he's just blundering the pawn. I mean, d5 is our best defended square. Yeah, we take toward the center. There's no reason to take with the e-pawn or with the knight. We take toward the center. And we also open up the c-file. Maybe later we'll want to put a rook on c8. If he plays bishop b5, given the type of player he is, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, this is likely. And... We've had this concept in many games now. If you've done the puzzle battle and you've done the puzzle rush, bishop is undefended, king is uncastled, boom, winning the bishop, winning the game. So you'll see people miss this tactic all the time. Keep your eyes peeled specifically for this tactic, specifically for this tactic, because it's missed so often at all levels, even at my level it's missed, because it's just not... You know, it's not instinctive to look for this kind of stuff. You don't assume that you can have uh, game-winning tactics or at least. So anyways, um, let's quickly go over that. Yeah, so knight f6 is called the Tartakower variation after French-Russian master Savielli Tartakower, who was a grandmaster. Uh, lived a long and sort of adventurous life. Uh, and he, he he's known for a lot of his, like, witty sayings. You know, like the, the person who wins is the one who makes the second to last mistake and all that kind of stuff. So in this position, a little bit of chess history. Spasibo. No, my him. All right. So this position first arose in 1888. In a game of Kurt von Bart 11, who lost a famous game to Steinitz. And the first people to play this played bishop f5. The first person to play knight f6 was Caro. Horatio Caro, I assume after him the Karakhan is named, but there's actually, con confusingly, there's more than one Caro who played the Karakhan. But Horatio Caro played knight f6. I think that's whom the Karakhan is named after. And yeah, so Caro played knight f6 and he was the, one, of the early, one of the earliest people to do that. So here's something interesting, guys. Horatio Caro played knight f6 in 1898. Then he played it again in 1905. And the only other person to play it around that time frame was Aaron Nimzovich. And the reason that is the case, in my estimation, yeah, I think he was British, is because people didn't want to double their pawns in the late 1800s, right? Positional chess wasn't that advanced. Thank you, Daniels. And it was only a couple of people ahead of their time who understood that there was more to the picture than just the pawn structure but if you were joe you know joe schmo chess player in the late 1800s you were taught that you know the, the positional chess wasn't non-existent but why would you double pawns without any provocation so nimzovich who wrote my system was far more advanced positionally than his peers so he played that f6 anyways um, I don't want to talk too much about this. We're going to have this many, many times throughout the speed run. But let me explain, and you guys already know that I have claimed again and again that pawn structure is not the most important um, factor in most positions for beginners and intermediate players. Um, and particularly one set of doubled pawns in the middle game is rarely going to be the reason that you lose the game or the reason that the evaluation is what it is. 
But in addition, this particular pair of doubled pawns is actually very healthy because this pawn on f6, consider the pawn highlighted in, in blue and then the pawn highlighted in, in red. Well, I'm not highlighting a pawn in red or in green. It says to use green. This pawn on f6 is, is controlling these two squares. And then this pawn controls this square. And that's a lot of central squares to control. And uh, this pawn on f6 is super annoying. In addition, there's the concept of shedding the skin. I call this shedding the skin. Um, this pawn on f5, let's assume that you use it as a battering ram, right? And you push it all the way to f3. And when my coach first told me this, I was kind of mind blown. Even after you do that, and even if you castle short, you're gonna be left with a fully intact kingside pawn structure. So you can often attack in this line after having castled on the same side that you're attacking and not suffer any consequences in terms of your pawn structure. So that's another thing. We haven't looked at a single line yet, but I hope I'm explaining some of the motivation behind it. The theory here is very complex. This line is super popular now. White has even developed some lines where he castles queenside, which uh, wasn't a thing for a long time. So c3, bishop d6. If you watch Magnus Carlsen games, you'll see this line happen all the time. White quickly piles up on the h pawn. Black gives a check, white covers it, and this move h5 has seen a resurgence recently. It looks pretty wild, but that's kind of what I mean. These pawns offer pretty good protection for the king. So in, term, in the event of a castle, you can actually push this pawn to h4 and use this pawn in order to weaken white's king side. Galway man, thank you for the tier one. So I'm not gonna delve any deeper into this. I don't wanna bore people to death. G takes f6 is also a move, but this is considered significantly more dubious. Anyways, he plays f3. And uh, bishop f5 is our move. We also could have taken and gone e5. The idea is to open up the pathway for the queen to h4. So in the event of d takes e5, queen h4, white is in big trouble. Um, and like I said, the reason we won't delve as deeply is because a little bit later, when we get to maybe 13, 1400, people will go into the main lines. So we'll talk about the theory then. Remember that the motivation here is to talk about stuff that's valuable mostly to the rating at which I'm currently at. So this is also good for black, but we decided to play it solid. And there's a very famous trap where white plays queen e2 and he threatens checkmate on d6. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. So here, for example, we should still play e6 in order to cover that square. Um, yeah. Can you explain the knight d2 versus e6 move order? I'm not sure what you mean. Can you can you spell that out? Yeah, so knight g5 by our opponent e6, and obviously d5 hastened the demise. He should have just developed his knight, then we could have even played h6, and this knight is nowhere good to go. And, um, yeah, we're better. But I was gonna explain something. Oh yeah, why didn't I take the pawn? So, this is a free pawn and black is better. But white can play knight f3 here. And white is ahead in development. He's developed two pieces. I've developed only one. And if I go, for example, e6, then white quickly castles. And guess what? White's already threatening knight g5. And this pawn on f7 could get in trouble. Black is two moves away from castling. And these kinds of attacks, they happen a lot faster than some people realize. So for example, if we play bishop e7, thank you, Benjamin covering the g5 square, how can white proceed? What is the best way to let the attack unfold here? So it's too early to sack the bishop. You won't have any pieces left. But the move that I have in mind is knight to e5. Also, some of you are proposing d5. That's like the move in the game, right? This square is very well protected by black. You're not gonna make this happen. But one of the pieces of advice that I have, and I've shared this from the very start, is not to get fixated on one particular idea, right? So if your opponent has prevented you from doing something, h4 would be too slow. Because by the time you get a knight to g5, black's already castled and this move has lost its, its luster to some degree. Instead, I would play knight e5 and I would bring the queen out to g4. I'm not sure this is possible because black takes the d4 pawn with check, but already you could start considering these kinds of moves, although this isn't that good. But I'm just trying to show you guys some of the ways in which this could have unfolded negatively for black. And I didn't want to allow any of this, given that we're trying to play very positionally. And so that's why I played knight bd7. Mr. Monotone, thanks for the prime. And at this point, of course, the game immediately ends after queen a5. Does anybody have any questions? What about bishop, G bishop g4? 
You mean in this position? Where exactly? I'm not sure where you're referring to. Why not bishop take? If you guys are asking a question, one move prior. You mean takes here? Oh, bishop g5. Oh, you want to play here. But that's not possible because I can take your bishop, right? I have two defenders on the g5 score, one indirectly. Well, one via yeah, x-ray. You're going to blunder the bishop. Carlson has played this with both sides, I think. Yeah. Why isn't king f7 that good? Where? Again, if you guys are asking questions about moves, try to be very specific. Like at the end of the game, you don't have to tell me the move number because you don't know it. But try to be specific as to where in the game that occurred. 